All right. Now we have four characters. Ah, uh, we have five characters. Shh. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. It's gonna be a long time. Oh shit. Ah, oh, fuck me. Just jump right into it, man. Holy crap. All right. All right, we'll start off with Kano. As he wandered through the back alleys, Kano gritted his teeth. Going after the guy in a bike had been a bad decision to call. By the time he got back up onto the pedestrian overpass, the man who thrown the attaché case was almost out of sight. Kano prided himself on being fleet of foot, but he knew even he would never catch the guy before he disappeared. He followed the culprit as far as the alleys, but there he lost him completely. All they could do now was hope one of his colleagues had caught the man on the motorcycle. Which they didn't. Kuzu's voice cracked the earpiece. Mobile command center calling all units. The suspect, <clears throat> the suspect on the motorcycle has handed off the case to an accomplice in Miyashita Park. Another foreigner. For real, Kano muttered. For real? For real? One thing immediately struck, struck him as strange. Why hand the case up to someone else at all? Why not just escape on the bike? The man with the motorcycle dumped the bike, the bike and fled on foot. We've retrieved the bike and ran the plate and determined it was a stolen vehicle. Mm-hmm. Okay. We still don't have enough details to positively ID the suspect. The, su the suspect now carrying the attaché case uh, is heading through Doganzaka, also on foot. We've got him under observation. Doganzaka, huh? That wasn't too far from where Kano was now. It looks like we're dealing with a foreign crime syndicate that's familiar with Shibuya. All units head to Doganzaka, but do not, I repeat, do not attempt to apprehend the suspect of the case. Let's see where he goes. Kano nodded to himself, without knowing more about the cro uh, crooks' demo. Letting this guy go for now is probably the only right call. I just want you all to know one last thing. Kuze's tone grew more solemn. Whatever happens, I know I can count on each and every one of you. Don't disappoint me. Over and out. <laughs> Kano had this unsettling feeling that the message had been meant for him. Right, it's now or never. Oh, right, it's now or never. The sudden appearance of the syndicate and its bizarre actions were rapidly moving things beyond the jurisdiction of both the MPD and the local police. Mutter mustering his resolve, Kano headed for Doganzaka. <laughs> Kano pulled the cell phone out of his pocket. It was Rumi calling. She knew full well he wasn't supposed to take calls while he was working the case. Maybe it was an emergency. He decided to pick it up. Rumi? I'm sorry, are you in the middle of something right now? Um, kind of. Is this an emergency? Um, well, yeah, so I'm in Shibuya right now. And Shibuya? Why'd she have to be in Shibuya now, of all times? So, um, my father came dead from Nagano all of a sudden. What? Rumi's father, Shizuo, had been softly opposed to the two of them getting married. Kano had visited his home many times, but the man had never even deigned to meet him. Yeah, he told me to tell you he wants to meet with you. What? Now? Kano blurred the words out with more alarm than he intended. I told him you were busy working, but he said he'd wait. This can't be happening, Kano whimpered to himself. I'm sorry, I know he can be demanding, but that's not the issue. Her dad offered to wait and made it harder for him to refuse. All right. But I'll have to call you back later, okay? I really am sorry. I'll be at a cafe called La Trick. It's by the train station. Rumi hung up. Damn. For a long moment, Kano stood in a day, staring at his phone. As if keeping up with the case wasn't stressful enough. Ah, uh, you... Mm. Mm. At last, he stumbled into motion. But even as he scoured Dogen's locker for any sign of the criminal, his mind remained fixed on the beginning of Rumi's dad. There was no way of knowing when he'd be done with, the, with this case for today. But he could be really passed up on a once in a lifetime opportunity to get her father's approval for a hand in marriage. Oh my god. Ah. 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 Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Maybe he could slip away for just a bit. There were plenty of detectives still tailing the suspect. Taking 50 minutes or so to meet with Shizuo wouldn't be such a big deal, would it? Oh no! Um. Yeah, let's do it. It's now or never, Kano decided. His future happiness depended on winning over Shizuo. He might not have the opportunity later if the kidnapping case would wind up going south. He just had to make sure he didn't linger too long. He was trying to decide the best way to save time as much as possible, when she caught sight of a, pa of a taxi passing by. <clears throat> he stepped out of the street to, uh, to flap the cab down. The station wasn't too far away, but it would be faster uh, to take a car to run than run there. Ugh. Oh my god. Ugh. My, like, I can't talk. <sighs> Careful, buddy, shouted the cab driver through the open window. You're gonna get yourself killed. 
Looking more closely, Kano saw that there was already someone in the back seat. Well, crap. He hadn't considered the, cra the cab might already be taken. Still, he didn't have time to wait for another to come along. Kano leaned in close to the back door of the, cat of the taxi. Please, I need, you I need you to let me have this cab. Beggars can't be choosers, after all. No way, snapped the passenger. He didn't seem the genial type. Please, I'm begging you here. Look, I'm in a hurry, pal. Get your own cab. I know how ridiculous this might sound, but please, this is really, really urgent. Urgent? Yes, it's a matter of life or death. Please! Look, I'm sorry, but I'm dealing with something urgent here, too. And let me ride with you. I'll pay for the whole fare. My entire, my entire future's on the line here. Sorry, buddy. It's life or death on my end, too. I gotta look after me in mind. Kana could see this going nowhere. Right. So sorry to trouble you. Oh, my God. Kana sits back in frustration. A taxi sped away. Kana scanned the area for looking for other cabs. Instead, he spotted the man with the attaché case. It was a stroke of dumb luck, but Kana wasn't going to lose sight of him now. He decided to follow. Man. Further up along Dogenzaka, in the direction of the purple was heading, was where Yamate Dori joined Route 246. Maybe the guy was planning to meet up with, with a getaway car. No, wait, hold on. If that were the plan, why would the gang have ditched the motorcycle earlier? Kana started tailing the man, racking his brain all the while. The suspect turned down a narrow side road. He wasn't heading toward Yamate Dori or Route 246 at all, but back toward Shibuya Station. What in the world was going on? It was starting to feel like the crooks were just messing with the investigation team. Kano radioed Kuzi on the wireless, which is a... whatever? Yeah. It's just a radio. Uh, sir, I don't think there's any point in seeing where this guy leads us anymore. That's not your call to make. Keep watching him. Sir, this is a waste of time. That girl might be in danger if Kano's argument was cut short as he saw the man take off. Hand out the attaché case to another foreigner. Again? How many times were these criminals going to pull this trick? The detectives broke into two groups to follow both of the men. Okay. Kana followed the man with the attaché case, who eventually led them to the area around Shibuya Station. Rumi and Chizuo should be waiting at a nearby cafe right now. Kana tried to remember their name. Lotric. Uh, oh! Kakinuma was the girl that, um, Achi uh, saved from fucking uh, street, street punks. Wait, it was based off of fr uh, French painter Henri de toulouse lautre Ah, oh, I don't know how to speak French. Huh. Alright. He kept his eye out for a place by that name as he tailed the target. Before long, he did spot the cafe. Its large plate glass window offered a view of the cozy interior. The sign out front read Lautrec. Looks like this was the place. Then I had the case with the intersection waiting for the light to change. Constantly an opportunity to appear inside. I spotted Rumi right away. She was facing away from him. So the man seated across from her must be her father. Uh, grew ordinary produce up in Dagano nowadays, but until then, uh, two years ago, he'd been a detective within the in, eh, he'd been a detective with the investigation division. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Rumi looked up to her father for his distinguished police career, and always spoke quite highly of him. Kana figured that if he became a policeman, Rumi might appreciate that. It was a simple impulse that led him to join the force. He had also figured that public servants could stay afloat even in times of recession, and that his physical training would serve him well in such a line of work. Once he was a policeman, he thought he could approach Shizuo with his head held high and ask for his blessing in marrying his daughter. Okay. Alright. But after Rumi graduated from university, Shizuo had up and retired from police work. Even Rumi didn't know why he'd made the decision. Kano had traveled to Nagano many times to ask Shizuo for, for, for permission to marry her, but the only response he ever got was, I'm not giving away my daughter to any cop. Kano had never even gotten past the intercom before her father turned him away. Years in the force had nearly made Kano lose sight of what made what had driven him to become a policeman in the first place, and now the chance to meet Shizuo face to face had finally come. He peered intently into the cafe. Across from Rumi sat an older man with a grim expression. <sighs> Just who was this hard-faced fellow? It took a lot to rattle Kano, but the guy looks scary. Could this really be his sweet little Rumi's father? The prospect of meeting with him later filled Kano with sudden dread. The man went into the JR Shibuya station and stood before the ticket machine. It looked like he was planning, he was planning to on boarding a train. A scene from a popular movie about a kidnapping sprang into Kano's mind, where the crook had made off with the ransom money after it was tossed out the window of a train. 
What if this guy managed to get outside the dragon and pull something like that? It looks, it looks like the suspect is going to a board train. Oh my god. Eh. Ah. Kano informed Kuze over the wireless. Make sure you stay on his tail. Apparently, Kuze still wants to string the purple on for a bit. You've got the lizard ready to pursue. What? Oh, motorcycles. Okay. <laughs> we'll establish our dragnet around whatever station he gets off at. The man purchased a ticket from the machine and passed through the gate. There was no way to tell what station he bought a ticket for, but it looked like he was heading clockwise along the Yamanote line loop. Connie used his prepaid card and made his way through the ticket gate as well. Okay. They don't get free rides in public transportation by ba flash badges. Um, okay. Oh, okay. <clears throat> An announcement chime signaled the imminent arrival of a train up on the platform. The man made his way up the stairs, looking calm and composed. He showed no sign of, check of checking for pursuers. Kano hurried after him. The man stopped at the very edge of the platform to await the train. Not ideal. There was no way for Kano to get close without sticking out like a sore thumb. A train glided up to the platform. The man gave a quick look around as he set the board. Kano followed. Trains of the Yamanote line didn't stop for long, and soon they were on their way. Ah, <sighs> glancing around, Connor noticed other MPD investigators had slipped aboard the train as well. And yeah, there we go. <clears throat> oh my God. Glancing around, Kano noticed other MPD investigators who had slipped aboard the train as well. Uh, the suspect stood behind the driver's compartment, staring, contemplated, uh, staring contemplatively at the scenery outside. The man's composure only served to rattle Kano more. A man in a gaudy necktie walked past Kano, talking on his cell phone. Yes, everything's going fine in this end, he said. There's no need to worry. In his other hand, he carried the same sort of attaché case as the man they were tailing. He headed right toward the driver's compartment and stood next to the suspect. Well, no, that's not suspicious. Connellina said subtly, straight to make out what he could of the phone conversation at the other end of the car. Oh my god. <laughs> yes, of course. 225 pages, all fully proofread. 225? Wait, wrong button. Article 225 of the Penal Code of Japan details kidnapping for profit and kidnapping for ransom. Accordingly, 225 is police shorthand for kidnapping. <clears throat> that was police jargon for kidnapping. Was this guy in cahoots with the kidnapper? Maybe the criminals had planted an attache hay swap. Uh, Kano watched the newcomer like a hawk. But rather than making contact with the suspect, the man turned around and strolled back the way he came. Uh, he hadn't done anything. He hadn't done anything suspicious at all. Yes. Right. Right. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Understood. Kano saw a glimpse of the man's face as he passed. He stopped and looked at Kano, seemingly aware that he was being watched. Kano decided to stare him down. Assert your dominance. Ah, my apologies. The man said. He shut his phone with a click. I know it's rather rude to talk on one's cell phone when you're on a train. That's just common decency. The man affected a smile, then headed back to the car from which he'd come. Got a good look at his face. Sheesh, guess I overreacted. Oh, you gotta stop staring at everyone. An oddly dressed passenger murmured into Kano's ear. Blend in your surroundings more. Oh, no. No. Sase, <laughs> when do you get here? His partner had somehow found time to change his disguise. No! A steel expression on his face with an ominous anime nerd getup. Kana had seen Sasuyama disguise himself as plenty of things throughout his years. Oh no! Oh. It's quite rare. It's quite rare for Sasuyama to actually wear a suit. On the rare occasion when he does, he's he's walking the halls of his own of his home precinct. He frequently goes unrecognized. Oh my god. Use this for train stakeouts, filled with posters and figurines. Don't forget the all great smile. Glasses are crucial. Bag of merch. Prize possession clusters to chest. Oh my god. Oh, tragic expression. Disguised for stakeouts with dockside warehouses. Sunglasses. Stute and posture amplify wild animal side. 
let co-workers know beforehand so as not to be mistaken for the real thing. La! Oh my god, arrest crooks while practicing discipline. Might help to stop funeral robbers. Handcuffs as handcuffs up sleeves. Oh. For nighttime stakeouts, hardcore material, plenty of exposure, emphasize bulginess in final version. Oh my god. This game is great. A chef, magician, samurai, and an astronaut to name a few. But this was a new extreme, even for him. When he first joined the forest, Kano had found Sasayama's costume antics amusing, wondering where he managed to find his outfits, but lately his quirk had become tedious. You like the ocean? Huh? Never mind. Sasayama pulled a small bottle from his breast pocket. Drink this while you can, I'm guessing you haven't eaten. Huh? What's this? The least I could do. He handed Kano the bottle and slipped away into the next department. It's Burning Hammer! Is that an energy drink? He'd pulled an all-nighter and hadn't eaten, so he was glad to have something. So he was glad to have something. He took a sip. Whatever this was, it was bland. It almost didn't taste like anything. This what had Sasayama given him? Ah, uh, what the heck? Anything's better than nothing. He brought the bottle to his lips and chugged the contents down. <sighs> he suddenly got a massive head rush. He felt a heat. A heat like a burning that spread from his insides throughout his whole body. No, that wasn't right. It was an ache. It was a ferocious ache, a burden that spread from his insides to his fingertips, and there was pain. A numbing that spread from his insides all the way down to his toes. Burning, aching, hurting, burning, aching, hurting, burning, aching, hurting, twitchy, itchy, dizzy, sleepy, chilly, willy-nilly, this was not good. This was super duper not good. He broke into a cold sweat, his forehead drenched, his body damp and clammy all over. He felt his grip and consciousness slipping. Sasayam, what the hell did you do to me? With bleary eyes, he squinted to read the writing on the bottle. Buh. Ernie. Burn. After a scant few letters, kind of blacked out. Did he give me poison? Bad end. Bitch, don't even. The least he could do. No! Mm, mm, mm. Mm, I wanted to read that. I wanted to read that hint. Fuck. All right. What? What's that fuck? Ooh, <laughs> fuck. The Super Club 90 raced down Route 246 toward Shibuya. And this is a motorcycle by Honda with an 85cc engine. Common set around town, off used by newspaper and post delivery workers. Um, the enthusiasts sometimes even swapping parts for the blah, blah, blah. Alright. <clears throat> the speedometer remained at a steady 60 kilometers per hour. Pumping the gas harder was no use. This was as fast as the bike would go. Minoru Minorikawa shouted as he sped along. Damn it, I am not letting you die! He tricked the handlebars and blew past the truck on the, on the inside. A driver scowled at him as he shot by. You maniac, you're trying to get yourself killed? Just the opposite, Minorikawa shouted back. I'm saving lives! The stoplight ahead turned red, cutting him off at the intersection. Oh, come on! What the fuck? He had no choice but to slam on the brakes. But his agitation boiled over as he waited for the, for the signal to change again. How long is this, gonna, this thing going to stay red? Hurry up already! He brought the bike up right to the very edge of the line, keeping the engine red like a drag so ready to peel out. Not on time is not in my dictionary! The light turned red. Oh my god. Then Minorikawa's own light turned green at last. He had to accelerate as hard as he could. His engine died. <laughs> his engine died sputter. Oh, come on, what the hell? Car horns uh, blared angrily behind him. In a fury, he pulled his bike over to the side of the road. Nice. Nice. No matter what he did, the engine refused to turn over. Was the problem with the spark plug or maybe the battery? Whatever it was, he didn't have time to figure it out now. With tears in his eyes, he left the bike. His companion of 10 years abandoned on the roadside. Ah, he was about to break into a run when he saw a taxi dead ahead letting out a passenger. He hurried to hop into the cab. Just head for the Shibuya station. I'll let you know exactly where once we get there. The taxi driver nodded coolly. Of course, sir. Ten minutes, huh? I need you to get me there in ten minutes. I'm afraid getting there in ten minutes is a bit... Fifteen, then. Sir, that's still... Look, that's all the time I can afford. Assuming traffic conditions can operate, sir, then maybe. I can't make any promises. 
His name was Hachiro Kim Kimizuka. He was a middle-aged fellow, looked a bit, a little rough around the edges. Mr. Kimizuka, I chose you for this. You can do it. Chose me? Sir, I'm pretty certain we met by chance. Okay, sure, I suppose you could phrase it that way. Anyhow, can we get going? Right, Kimizuka said with a faint sigh. I'll see what I can do. Taxi pulled away at a decent clip. Let's go, let's fucking go. <clears throat> Minorakawa's fr frenzied journey had started 20 minutes earlier. He'd been at home, working on an interview piece. He clicked his tongue at annoyance as the uh, ringing phone broke his train of thought. Why did someone always call right where the words were flowing? If he didn't keep getting interrupted, he could probably wrap this piece up in no time. Be quiet, he pointed at the phone as he yelled. I'm writing here! But shouting did nothing to silence the ringing. He didn't have much choice but to... You can just, like, silence it, right? There's like, you just push the hang up button. Minora Kawa speaking. There was no response. Hello? Uh, he hesitated, ready to, ready to hang up. What's this prank call? It's me. It's Toyama. It was Teruo Toyama, the president of Heaven Publishing. And this is a public company that puts out hard hitting nonfiction books and tablets that scandal rags, blah blah blah. Uh okay. Alright. <clears throat> oh, what do you want? If this is about work, I'm already booked pretty full. He'd taken work from heaven publishing on several occasions, but the uh, the pay was hardly competitive. Lately he'd been turning down a lot, so we hadn't heard from Toyama in a while. No, this isn't work related. And what do you want? I'm kinda pressed for time here, working on some copy. Minorika was in no mood to beat around the bush. It seemed like every conversation he had with Toyama went like this. Ah, you're busy. That's good. Busy's good when you're a freelancer. Toyama sounded unusually sympathetic. Minorikawa found it off-putting. I hear sales have been good on your end, he said cautiously. With this month's four-star general gossip and all. Four-star general gossip was a monthly magazine. Heaven That's a flagship publication. Okay. Uh... Yeah, okay. <clears throat> it had a small circulation, and for the most part, it flew under the radar. Uh, but once in a while, they advanced a big scoop and sell like crazy. This month's edition had come with a free scratch card, a gimmick that had moved 100,000 copies with ease. Five winning symbols in a row wins 100,000 yen, was it? Minorikawa asked. A weak, moist sound came through the receiver. Huh? Baffled, uh, Minorikawa listened more closely. Came again, then again. It kind of sounded like sobbing. Mr. Tayama, are you crying? There was another soft job, sob, and then yet another. What's going on? Where are you? Minorikawa asked. At the office, Tayama managed. He let out another mewling whimper. Whimper. What's the matter? It's nothing. Well, it's gotta be something. Come on, what is it? Tayama gave no reply. Mr. Tayama, you still there? Silence. What is it? What happened? Hmm. Well, that doesn't tell me anything. What the hell's going on? Tayama squeaked out a drawn-out whine. Okay, I'm sick of this. I'm hanging up now. Minorika was about to break the connection when he heard Toyama murmur. The only thing I can do now is die. The taxi lurched to a sudden stop as the driver slammed on the brakes. Nice. Minorika would pitch forward, his face back against the back of the seat in front of him. Kimizuka stuck his head out the window. Careful, buddy, he said to someone in the street ahead. You're going to get yourself killed. Minorikawa blinked the stars from his eyes and saw a man moving alongside the cab. The guy grabbed onto the handle of the back door. Please, I need you to let me borrow this cab. Ugh! Ah! No way, Minorikawa snap! Just who did this guy think he was? Please, I'm begging you here. Look, I'm in a hurry, pal. Get your own cab. I know how ridiculous this is my sound, but please, this is really, really urgent. Urgent! Yes, it's a matter of life or death. Please. The guy did look pretty desperate. Look, I'm sorry, but I'm dealing with something urgent here, too. Then let me ride with you. I'll pay for the whole fare. My entire future's on the line here. What the fuck? The guy sure was persistent. Maybe he was telling the truth. But Minorikawa had problems of his own. Sorry, buddy. It's life or death at my end, too. I gotta look after me and mine. Right. So sorry to trouble you. Finally, the guy gave up and shuffled away. Guess it couldn't have been that much of a life-ending crisis after all. Ah, <coughs> uh, Minorikawa checked his wristwatch. Damn it! That just cost us five minutes! I'll try to make it up, sir. Driver called back. Oh my god. 
Oh my god. <laughs> it ra he ran up the stairs. Holy shit. He avoided the elevator forever rushing up the stairs. Having publishing on the third and fourth floors. And unlike the hood tunnel, blah, 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 on the fourth floor. When he got there, however, the door was locked. Mr. Toyama. Hey, Mr. Toyama. He shouted and banged, but there was no reply. Something was seriously wrong. Minorikawa took a deep breath and kicked the door in. Whoa! The sight as he stepped into the, ho into the office filled him with horror. Minorikawa clutched the sides of his head. I'm too late. Oh, that's fucking messed up. What the fuck? Oh no, if only I'd gotten here a little sooner. 